I'm so glad you guys are here with us this morning. My name is Zachary Fraley. I'm over our uh, youth ministries here, and I get to be the adult child on staff. It's great. I love my calling. I love my job. And um, and I love being here on Sundays as well. And uh, Sundays are literally one of my favorite places to be. It, it's here at church that I get recharged, that I get refueled. I, I sort of get re-centered so that I can go about going into the world throughout the week and fulfilling the calling that Jesus has for me on my life. And I'm just so thankful that you guys are here. Here. I'm thankful you guys are joining in on our, at our online campus, at our jail campus, and I also want to say hello to our Hebron campus. I'm so glad you guys are here with us today. I've never been the virtual, you know, the virtual pastor, so I, I was like, I was like, how does it look? I, I wanted to like try it out and do a few things and like run from either side of the stage and be like, look at me, I'm virtual. I, I, in my mind, when you know, when Pastor John uh, explained it, I was like, oh wow, is it going to be like Star Wars? You know, when Princess Leia comes up in a hologram? Is that what I'm going to look like? I don't know. It, it looks better. It's cooler. Um, but I want to thank you guys for being here. As you can tell, I'm, I, I do, um, you know, I am the adult child on staff, you know, and I do get to, uh, you know, teach our youth about Jesus. So um, thanks for being here. We're currently in this sermon series. Oh, I'm out of breath called What Matters Most? And um, and I really like that question, right? Uh, what matters the most to you? For, for each of us, I feel like we would all, you know, sort of label in a uh, different order, what matters most to us? So, you know, for some of us, we might say our family. For some of us, uh, Jesus is the first thing that matters. For some of us, maybe money or politics or uh, maybe uh, your work. What, what are the things that matter most to you? On your seats, I actually, there's this little card and it says, um, what matters most? And I just want you to, will you just take that off really quickly? And uh, just, it's one through five. I want you to just write out what matters most to you. You know, what is the first thing that matters most to you? It might be your wife or your spouse or your kids or maybe your little puppy dog, whatever it is, uh, will you just write down in order what matters most to you? Because we've been talking about that question for the past five weeks, and I just wanted to ask you guys what mattered most, what matters most in your life. And I know for me, before Jesus, what mattered most to me was not Jesus. It was not, you know, um, following after him. It, he was not on the top five of my list. Uh, he probably wasn't even, if you gave me 200, he might sort of be in there somewhere. But I sort of wanted to look at um, when I think about this, I, I, my mind immediately went to Family Feud. And um, do you remember, dun, 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 and, and, um, and the Family Feud questions, and it's like, what matters most to Zachary? And survey says, and so I just really wanted to play that game with you guys today, Family Feud here. Uh, what mattered most to Zachary prior to giving his life to Jesus? There are only five things, okay? Um, and the first thing that mattered to Zachary was, survey says, me, 70%. Mattered, me mattered, okay? Um, let me see, number two, myself, 10%. Wow, there we go. He might have been narcissistic, yeah, a little bit. Uh, number three, me, myself, and I literally took up 90% of what I thought about at all times. And then maybe down at the bottom, I thought about money, and uh, maybe a little bit I thought about fame, right? And and those were the things that I would have probably put on my list. If somebody were to give it to me, I would have been me, myself, I, money, fame. And, um, and my question to you is what matters most to you in your life? Will you just put that there? I know for me, that list, y'all are, are looking at that list and y'all are like, oh my goodness, what happened? You know, um, that's crazy. But I mean, that's how my life got started off. It was all about me. I was Texas' most beautiful baby. I sang in little talent shows. Some of y'all are laughing. It's true. I have like a little picture with a crown. And um, I sang in all the talent shows. I uh, soloed with the San Antonio Symphony. I soloed and starred in operas. My life was about me. And if there was a main character of the story, if, if, if my life was a movie, it was all about Zachary. And have you ever pretended like that? Like you are in a movie and all the cameras are just looking on you and you're just strutting your stuff. You're going to Starbucks and getting your venti latte and you're just pretending like everybody is looking at you. It, it might just be me and my, you know, pre-Jesus narcissism. And some of y'all are like, I I've never thought about that. But um, you, I might be the only one in this boat. But I had this serious problem where I thought the whole wide world revolved around Zachary. Now looking back, I lived my life as if I was the main character of this movie. I uh, strutted my stuff as if all the eyes were on me. I treated people poorly and what, uh, did whatever I wanted. And I had a Bible verse in my Instagram bio. Uh, I would go to church every now and again. But for all intents and purposes, it was the Zachary show. And it was all about me. 
Have you ever felt like that? Like the world revolved around you, like, like all the eyes are on you and you are the main character of your life there. You have to be the center of attention. You have to always be right. Um, and like you, uh, no one can do it like or better than you. I don't ask these questions in order to point fingers and you know, some of your spouses are nudging at you and you're like, oh my gosh, my ribs, you know, ow, Zachary, stop. I just wanna ask this question. In what ways are you the main character of your life? In what ways are all the mental cameras looking at you with a spotlight on you? Because the sad thing is when you are the main character, the story ends when you do. When you're, you are the main character of your life, the story ends when you do. I mean, we have all seen those stories and we've all seen those TV shows, right? Where there's a main character and suddenly they, they're fired or they, they quit. And these TV show ends when they do. But when Jesus is the main character of your life, you're able to leave a legacy. You're truly able to see generation after generation become fully devoted followers of Jesus. There's a continuance. There's a second season as you teach others about Jesus and how to make him the main character of their life. But that only comes when Jesus is the main character. And there was this man in the Bible, and uh, he's a man that lived his life as though he was the main character. Uh, he lived as though all of the eyes were on him. He, he lived like he was, um, like he could do whatever he wanted to do. He believed whatever he wanted to believe. He even had specific laws, uh, specific vows that he was supposed to follow, but he thought that he was, a, uh, was the exception. He searched for the loopholes. He, he searched for ways to circumvent these vows, and his name is Samson, and you might have heard his name. You, you probably heard about him in uh, Sunday school or, you know, back in First Kids when you were a wee little kid, but um, he truly lived his life as though he was the main event, as though his life, as though he was the main character of his story, not truly honoring God the source of his strength. And our story begins when he was born and he was just a wee little baby. It says, when her son was born, she named him Samson. And pay attention to the bold parts, but the Lord blessed him as he grew up uh, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Here enters Samson. He's just a wee little baby, seven pounds, six ounces, right? But something is different about him. God blesses him as he grows up. The spirit of the Lord begins to stir in him. And I wonder who the main character of the story is, right? Is it Samson here or is it God who keeps showing up? The Lord blessed him. The Lord started to stir in his life. Samson, for a while, he was very dedicated to God. He lived his life for God alone. He took some pretty uh, strict Nazarite vows. Uh, the three main ones were, one of them was, you know, he couldn't actually cut his hair. And for, for some of us, y'all are like, oh my goodness, you know, me, I go, I go to Ashley every three weeks over at Dina's hair salon and get my hair cut over there. I, otherwise, I start, you know, looking not too great. Um, I don't know if I could go with, you know, just an unkempt mane, but uh, he took this vow never to cut his hair. The second one is a little less difficult for you and me. He said, I'm never going to touch a dead body. And you know, not many of us, you know, we, we, not many of us go about touching dead bodies on a regular basis. So some of us are like, okay, you know, Zachary, I'm a, I'm a little down for these Nazarite vows. Okay. I could think about that. But then the third part was that he would never drink fermented drinks. So no wine, no vinegar. And this is where some of y'all are like, check please. Like, oh my goodness, I can't be a Nazarite, Zachary. I, I'll, I'll talk with you later. But Samson, at least in part of his life, God was the main character and these vows to him, they were tertiary. It didn't matter because he was going about serving God. God was the main character in his life. He saw that God had blessed him, that the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. And he said, okay, God, I'm going to do everything for you because I realize you are the main character and not about, and it's not about me. And the account goes on. Samson pre sees this pretty woman, you know, and he's like, he, he, he was uh, swiping right. And he was like, oh my goodness. And, and he, he saw her and he was like, I'm too nervous to swipe right. He's like, dad, dad, can, can, you, can you swipe right for me? Can you, can you go over to Timna where she is and ask her for her number, right? Uh, get dad, I am just so nervous. Literally me with Blair. When I first met her, I was like, woo, wow, that is, you know, and I got a little bit nervous. But so he says, please, dad, will you go get her number for me? And so it, they go on. On this journey, it says, uh, it, Samson told his father, hey, get her for me. She looks good to me. Isn't that how so many love stories start? Hey, can we get her number? She looks good to me, right? Wow. That, we can obviously tell, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't very great with words, okay? Um, his father and mother didn't realize that the Lord was at work. Again, again, we, we see that God is the main character in the story. He keeps popping up. In, uh, the Lord is at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at that time. 
as Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah. Oh, and then um, we'll go back. But uh, this, the thing is that they go down and he meets this girl. And, um, and the thing is, Samson starts thinking that he is the main character of the story, that it is all about him. But we see somebody at work behind the scenes in it all. So Samson and his parents, they pack up their bags and they, they go back home. They, they uh, rent a tux for Samson. And then they come back to Timnah. They start traveling back to Timnah. And it says, as Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment, the spirit of the Lord, again here, God is coming. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. And I love this part because Samuel, Samuel here sort of gives us an analogy to be like, hey, you know, he, he did it this easily, right? He said, it says, he did it as easily as if it were a young goat. I don't know how many of you have ever, you know, hurt a young goat or executed him by ripping his jaw off here, but Samson apparently thinks that all of us have a frame of reference with a young goat. As I'm reading this, I'm like, what is happening? I, the only time I've actually seen goats in person is at Renee and Austin Sanders' house or maybe on TikToks, and I don't even know if I could catch one, much less harm it, right? I, I, I don't, but, but here he says he did it as easily as if it were a young goat. To, to put it more in 21st century terms, um, he ripped this lion's mouth off as easily as you would open a bag of Doritos sitting on your couch during quarantine. There we go. Now y'all are like, oh, I get it. Wow, he was that strong? Oh my goodness. And, and it goes on and it says, he didn't tell his father or mother about it when Samson arrived in Timnah. He talked with the woman and he was very pleased with her. I love this verse here. And not just due to the amazing scene where the man rips up the line, but I love how Samson, or Samuel, the author, the, the person who is writing down this account, just thinks that we all know exactly what it's like to execute a goat, right? Um, I, I don't even, man, I don't, I, I don't even look at animals that much. You know, we're, we're driving by in wheat field and I see a cow, I'm like, moo, and they look at me and then we just keep driving. It's fun. But, um, but he, he does it so easily. The spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he it totally saves his family. He saves himself. When I read this account, it seems like a made-up account to me, right? It seems like Samson is this superhero with super strength. And sometimes when I read the Bible, I'm like, can that really happen? Could, could a man really be swallowed by a fish? Can this be real? And the thing is, what I love about the Bible is that it's backed up by archaeological uh, facts. It's backed up by archaeological evidence that proves that it is true. In 2012, they actually found this coin. Um, they actually found this coin that depicts Samson with the lion, right? And this was actually made made during the time that Samson was alive. It was circulated. There, there were many coins like this, we can believe. And it actually proves that this actually happened. There's actual archaeological evidence that Samson actually did this with a lion. And, and I know it's crazy, right? It's crazy to me to think that there was somebody that strong. But the thing is, we know that something doesn't come from nothing. We know that there's a supernatural world. And right here, we see the supernatural intermingling with the natural in a pretty remarkable way. So then to move on, his family goes to Timnah. He likes the lady. She likes him. They decide that they're going to get married. And it says um, later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path and he started looking at the carcass of the lion. They had gone home and they were coming back now. And he found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. He scooped some of the honey into his hands and he ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother and they ate it, but he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of a lion. This verse is probably the scariest verse out of the whole Samson account to me. This is, this is where I'm like, oh my goodness, this, this is getting scary. Why? Throughout the whole account of Samson's life, we have seen the influence of God. You, you've seen the highlighted yellow areas where it says the Lord moved, the Lord provided, the Lord gave him strength. He had his eyes on the prize, but here Samson takes his eyes off of God he turns away from God in his way. Remember the, those vows that he had made? He, he made some very specific Nazarite vows where he said, don't touch a dead body. He's not gonna cut his hair. He's not gonna drink fermented drink. And it's not like Samson didn't know these things, but here he crosses the line. He sees that honey surrounded by a dead carcass and he says, well, that, that looks really sweet. And we see this shift from, uh, from Sam, in Samson's life from following God and his leading to following Samson in his own choosing. The account of Samson mentions less and less of God in, in, throughout the whole story. As Samson takes center stage, as, as he moves into the spotlight, this is the first account of his whole life where we don't see the influence of God in his life. And sadly, it started with one little area of compromise. 
God, I know I made these vows to you. I know, I know I promised I would never touch a dead carcass, but man, that honey looks really good. God, I know I have been living my life for you, but I need a little me time right now. And isn't that how it starts? It's not like one day we just walk away from God, but we start compromising little by little in our lives. God, I know that that thing is surrounded by death. I know that there's this honey surrounded by a carcass and decay. I know that this is not gonna be good for me. I know it's just a little bit compromising, but it's just a little bit of honey. It's just a little bit of death, God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wanted something so badly? I mean, guys, you look at a lady and you're like, whoo, there is some honey. And you know that she's not a follower of Jesus. You know that it's not gonna end up good for you. You know that it's bad, surrounded by death, but you compromise. It's, it's just a little bit. Doesn't God want me to be happy, right? As a result of this little compromise, we see God showing up less and less in the narrative of Samson's life. And we can look at him and we can say, oh, Samson, Samson, don't you realize God's the main character? Why are you messing up? Samson, come on, you, you, you should have followed your vows. It's something that I like to ask myself when, when I read the Bible, when I read these accounts, uh, it, it helps to really center it and, and help me apply this to my life. But I ask, how am I in this account? How am I going after the things of this world? What does God want me want to teach me in this moment? So what does God want to teach us in this moment? Uh, this area of compromise as Samson turns little by little away from God. And so the story goes on. Samson goes to the wedding. He starts feeling guilty. So he, he sort of gathers everybody around. He's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little riddle, okay? And, and it's sort of like his little way of confessing his sin without actually telling them what it is. And he says, out of the one who eats came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. He's obviously talking about the lion with the honey here. And it's like Samson knew that he had crossed this line and he needed to confess to somebody, but he didn't have the strength to say it. No matter how good the honey tasted in that moment, there was this aftertaste of guilt. There was this aftertaste that, that plagued Samson. So he says it sort of in this backwards way and the story begins to take a turn for the worse. The, the men, they ask Samson's wife, they're like, hey, will you tell him um, to tell us what the riddle is, what the answer is? So Samson uh, they, they go and they, they say, hey, here's the answer. And Samson goes and he kills 31 men and he goes home without, any, uh, with a, without a wife. Literally, Samson starts going off the deep end. He's becoming more and more violent. He's becoming deranged. He's becoming unhinged. And he comes back to find his ex-wife is married to somebody else. He then sets some tails on fire, right? This story is where, it's where it gets a little crazy. He takes some foxes, puts, uh, puts some stuff on their tails, sets it on fire, puts them through the wheat fields, and it burns up all the Philistines' food. This is better than reality TV. And the Philistines, they're triggered. They're like, oh my goodness, he just burned all of our food down. And then Samson hits rock bottom. He has no wife. Peta is mad at him for what he did to the foxes, right? Uh, the foxes are triggered with him. The Philistines hate him. And he's at rock bottom. Literally, the, the account brings us to Samson in a cave. He lived his life as if he was the main character. And it led him to compromise in little ways that led to larger problems. Now his life is falling apart. So what does he do? He keeps living his life like he is the main character. He keeps living his life saying, it's all about me. Only going to church when things got bad, only praying to God when he actually needed help, only, you know, only going to church when he was actually you know, overwhelmed by things instead of always faithfully attending and following after Jesus. And it all started with one little area of compromise. As our account of Samson's life progresses, Samson is captured, they find him in the cave, and then they decide to take him back to Lehi, the, the place that they all lived. And it says, as Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines, they came shouting in triumph, but the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. It, again, God comes back to save him. And he snapped the ropes of his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax. Again, like, well, I don't even know what flax is. And they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and he killed 1,000 Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have killed 1,000 men. Look at all I have done. Look at my strength. Everybody, look at me. I'm the main character. He forgot that God was the one who provided him strength. I, gave, I killed all these men with the donkey of a jawbone. Here, Samson is still trying to be the main character, not giving any of the glory to God. And at this point in the account, this is where I want to close the Bible. This is where I want to close it and look away and not look at the account as, as Samson becomes more and more deranged, more and more unhinged as he kills all these people, all these needless lives. How did our hero get here to the point of killing 
a thousand people and reveling in it, uh, it started with one area of compromise. And his anger and rage overtook him. Samson at this point is unhinged, a bit deranged from living for himself first. He is the main character of the story. And as such, he answers to no one. And he ends up hurting everyone, including himself. After this, there's a bit of peace for the Israelites. But years later, Samson meets this woman named Delilah who, who keeps badgering him and asking, hey, where does your strength come from? Where does your strength come from? And one day he finally gives in and he says, hey, it comes from these beautiful, luscious locks of hair. So Delilah, his girlfriend at the time, decides to give him a new do. Says so Delilah old Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. And then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down. And his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. I don't know where that voice came from. <laughs> when he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Reveling in their victory, uh, the people, the Philistines, they start celebrating the victory. They turned down for what? They partied like it was 1200 BC and they were like, we took him down, right? We, we took down Samson. And then they got a little confident. They asked to bring Samson out. And during this whole time, uh, they, they took him to the temple of Dagon, which was the God, the false God that they worshiped. And in, during that time, I believe Samson, you know, started to hear um, how they worshiped that God by, by cutting people's hands off, by cutting their heads off, by, by hurting and harming people. And he starts turning to God again. And um, he, they asked to bring Samson out. And the Philistines, all the Philistine officers and leaders were there, 3,000 in all. And it says, Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, hey, can you place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple? I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there. And there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who were watching as Samson amused them. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, sovereign Lord. He turns to God, sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time with one blow. Let me uh, pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple, pushing against them with both hands. He prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all of the people. So he killed more people when he died than, when, uh, than uh, he had during his entire lifetime. It's sad. It's sad. This is a sad ending to our story. We see our misled and imperfect hero die. But as one last final act, he moves out of center stage and he puts God in his rightful place as the main character. And the amazing thing about this account is not, uh, it's not just a story that we read back in First Kids to the Kids, right? It's not just something that somebody made up in their basement. It is a real account of a man who was radically blessed by God. And they actually have found archaeological evidence, all right? They, they've actually found where this temple was. They, they found the two pillars that held up the roof of this whole place. They found the temple of Dagon. And, and again, I love that the the Bible is backed up by history and archaeological evidence. Um, it was known as the Temple of Dagon where some pretty horrific things happened, where people's heads and hands were lopped off in worship of their God. And Samson saw all of this happening. And he knew that he had to do something to save his people. And Samson, in a last effort he, to help his people and so many others, he turned to his God and he said, God, will you give me one, uh, will you give me one more bout of strength? Throughout this account, we see that God is truly the main character. But how many of us are living as though we are the main character of our lives? Looking at the account of Samson, we see so clearly that God was at the center of it all. He was and is the main character. And Samson knew, he knew that for a while in his life, but he forgot. And at the end of his life, with his strength sapped, with his hair cut, with his eyes gone, he looks up to God in his heart and he asks God to do one more mighty thing through him. He offers his life. It was as if he was imprisoned and he looked back and through the chapters of his life, through every moment of his life, and he realized that God was there. He looked back and, and he remembered the Lord had blessed him. The spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. The Lord was at work. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. But the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. It was like he looked back and he saw all the times that God was the main character of his life. I remember when I looked back at my life and I saw how God had sustained me, how the Holy Spirit had, had kept me safe, how Jesus had preserved my life time and time again. And it was at that moment that I decided to step out of the spotlight and to put God in his rightful place as the main character of my life. It wasn't easy, 
But I, I was so accustomed to people looking at me. But as, as I started to follow Jesus, I began pointing more and more to him saying, it's all about Jesus and not about me. So the question lies, how do we make Jesus the main character of our life? How do we make God the main character of our life? Number one, we begin by turning to God. Samson had so many moments where he saw God's faithfulness, where God gave him strength, but he began seeing it as his own and turning from God. He began eating honey and doing what he wanted and turning from God. Remember, he saw that honey and it looked good to his eyes. In order for us to ensure that God is the main character, we have to fix our eyes on God. Unlike what Samson did in much of his life, but just like he did at the end of his life. We realize, that we realize where we have gotten off course, the little areas of compromise that have led to some bigger areas of sin, and we realign, we begin to be honest with God and ourselves and confess our sins to him. In this account, we don't really hear that much about Samson as a young boy, but we can sort of imagine that, that he was probably a nice person, right? He probably used his strength to help other people. He probably um, served other people as his Nazarite vows um, led him to do. But what happens when you start putting focus on yourself? You start hurting other people, right? He started hurting other people as he became the main character. I know I did that in my life. When I lived as the main character, uh, uh, instead of having God as the main character, I hurt so many people. I, I left so many broken relationships. I had so many broken relationships with families, with, with my friends. I hurt my family. And that's what I did because I couldn't see past myself. And Samson does the same thing as the main character. He can only think about what makes him happy, what makes Samson's life feel better. And I can see that so clearly in my life as well. Following God changed me. I no longer hurt people. I look to these baptism videos and, and what they said, that, that Jesus healed the relationships in their life, that, that Jesus helped them to see the ways in their lives, the forgiveness and, and the ways that they could forgive others. And he healed relationships and their lives were changed. As a result of putting Jesus as the main character, as a result of turning to God, my relationship with my grandfather was saved. My relationship with my sister was saved. And my relationship, uh, what relationship in your life it needs to be saved? What relationship in your life will be healed as you make God the main character? As we turn to God, we see uh, that we need to value others and the beauty that they bring and the relationships uh, that they can bring as they are restored in Jesus. Samson's strength, it wasn't for himself, but God gave him the strength in order to help other people. How have you been focused on yourself in, uh, instead of others in your life? However it is, we need to turn to God and fix our eyes on him. Because when we look at ourselves as the main character, others end up getting hurt. But when we keep our eyes on Jesus, when we remind ourselves that he is Lord, and when we keep our eyes on him and turn to God, man, uh, it changes others' lives as well. In, uh, in Acts 3.19, Peter, who was one of the first Christians, tells us a little bit about this. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent and turn to God. Turn your eyes, turn your focus to him. Make him the main character of your life so that your sins can be wiped away and a time of refreshing can come. The thing that got Samson's focus off of God and was the honey in the carcass, something that looked great but was covered in death. What is the carcass of honey in your life? What is the area in your life that you compromise with? Isn't it so crazy that so many of the areas of our in our life that look the sweetest are covered in death? I mean, man, we are getting real today. Some of y'all are like, whoa, Zachary, can, can you just lean off a little bit? But we are dealing with a real man. We're looking at a real man who had some real sin and caused real hurt in his life. What areas in your life are you following after things that are covered in death? I mean, I have had all that the world can offer. I stand before you today, somebody who had it all, literally an Enneagram type seven, whose core sin is gluttony and nothing fulfilled me like Jesus. Nothing has ever given me strength like Jesus, no matter how good it felt, no matter how fun the honey was. Nothing changed my life as much as when I chose to follow Jesus, turn my eyes to him and make him the main character of my life. So how do we make Jesus the main character of our life? Number one, we begin by turning to God. And the second way is that we lay down our lives. Samson had these vows. He, he was laying down his life for so much of his life. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to follow these vows. I'm not going to cut my hair. I'm not going to touch a dead body. I'm not going to drink any fermented drinks. But what started to happen? He started to take his life back up. He, he stopped laying down his life daily. And where does it end, up in him, uh, where does it end him up? In a cave. It ends him up in a very unsatisfying relationship, not only uh, with his first almost wife, but with Delilah. 
He's taking his life back. He's not living it for God. And he's not living it with God as the main character. And I, I see this a lot, especially when students go off to college, right? You know, they've come to next gen. They've, they've lived their life. They're not going to parties anymore. They, they've continually laid down their life for God. And they go off to college and they're like, you know what? I, I did. I did it. You know, I, I laid down my life a lot. You know, now, don't I deserve to have a little bit of fun? Don't I deserve to just have a little bit of this honey? And they turn from God. They, they pick their lives back up and they start, they stop following after him. They put themselves as the main character of their own lives. And, and it leads them to some pretty unsatisfying places. And Samson realized that he realized that he has taken his life back. And at the end of his life, he seeks to lay it down, but it's almost too late. When Samson really realized it, he, uh, when Samson realized that his true strength would not be seen in battle, he realized that his strength wasn't going to come from, uh, his, his true strength wasn't uh, uh, found in slaying people with a donkey's jawbone, but his true strength was found in giving his life for other people. We lay down our life because we want people to be built up rather than torn down. Even if you aren't a Christian, even if you don't follow Jesus, you can surely see how much you would give your, uh, give your life up so that your children can have a better life. You would lay down your life so that they could be built on your sacrifice. And I'm sure you see where I'm going because that is exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life for you and for me. He gave it all up so that we can know what true love looks like. Jesus, the son of God died on a cross so that we could spend eternity with him. Not, an imper not as an imperfect man like Samson, but as the perfect man that, that never sinned. And through his sacrifice, he made a way for us to experience heaven, eternity with him. And as we make God the main character of our life, we imitate him in doing this. As we lay down our lives and we build others up, we stop focusing on ourselves as much as others, right? And, and we begin to look to others and make God the main character. We begin to build others up as we lay down our lives. Paul, someone who turned his whole life around for Jesus, uh, bears it clearly. And he says, I will rejoice even if I lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Paul here tells us that the true joy of his life is laying down his life for God, pouring it out, pouring it out in service to God and to his kingdom because God was the main character in his life. And he knew that God was the only thing that truly mattered and he wanted others to know. He wanted others to experience the joy of heaven that he knew one day he was going to experience. And he knew that God had it all in, under control. So Paul laid down his life. Samson laid down his life. And Jesus laid down his life as well so that we could have a better one. And they all did it because they realized that God was the main character. It was all about him. They saw God working in and through their lives and they saw his faithfulness and they laid down their lives to build others up. Have you been feeling unsatisfied in your life? Have you been feeling like you have hit rock bottom in your life? Have your eyes been taken off God and put on yourself? How have you been living your life with God as a main character? I believe the unfulfillment we feel can be traced back to two things, us taking our eyes off God and us taking our lives back. So how do we fix it? We point everyone that we know to Jesus. Not to ourselves, not to our own strength, not to our own glory, but we point others to the one who gave his life so that we could find ours. We point others to the only one who can truly give everlasting life. And we say, you should, fill, you should uh, plant your life on him, on the firm sacrifice of Jesus. You should build your life on him. You should lay down your life in service of him and have Jesus as the main character of your life. I love this verse um, from Paul. He says, my old self, it's been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It is no longer I who live but Jesus lives in me. Jesus has the main, uh, is the main character of his life each and every day. And he points everybody that he knows to Jesus. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you still living your life as the main character? As if you were the one in the spotlight or have you realized by now that it is all about just Jesus? At the beginning of this message, I, I asked this question, what matters most to you. And I'm sure there are so many things on that list. There's so many things that you wrote down and, and you probably wanted, you know, 10 or 15 more spots to continue to write because there's so many things that matter to you. But what matters most to you in your life? 
I hope that, that this message uh, sort of shifted those uh, things around a little bit. And if you actually pull out that card that I actually I asked you to write on, I want you to turn it over. And I want you, if, if in this message, your priority shifted a little bit, if in this message, you, you realize that, that you need to realign some things, I want you to just put a star on the top of that. And I want you to rewrite out, what are the things that matter most to you? Even if you wrote Jesus at the top of that list, I hope that you are encouraged and spurred to keep him as the main character in the story of your life. And we do that by keeping our eyes on him, by laying our life down each and every day and pointing others to Jesus, turning to him, laying our life down and pointing everyone that we know to Jesus and saying, you should make him the main character of your life. You should live your life founded on him. How can you fix your priorities? How can you make sure that God is what matters most to you this week? I, again, I just want you to write out on that list, on that paper, what matters most to you. You can take it out. You can write it out right now. But what is that number one thing? In closing, I just want to uh, go back to one of the first points I made. When you are the main character, the story ends when you do. But I love this next point. But when Jesus is the main character, your story continues into eternity. Your story, your legacy continues into eternity. Your children's 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 generation after generation. See the sacrifice. See, the, uh, see how you had Jesus as the main character of your life. What I love about Samson's story is, not, is, that, is that God didn't try to be in the spotlight. He didn't try to take the glory for himself. He was okay in the supporting role and supporting Samson's life. But Samson missed the opportunity to make God the main character. The only reason we remember Samson, the only reason that his account is written so vividly in the Bible is because at the end of his life, he sidestepped and he said, it's not about me. I'm getting out of the spotlight. I'm going to make God the main character of my life. God isn't going to make the main, himself the main character of your life. That's your decision, but he deserves to be the main character. He, there is no one as worthy. There is no one as loving. There is no one as mighty. There is no one as good as our king, and he deserves to be the main character of your life that you point everyone to. Your story and your life, it's not just about you. As you make Jesus the main character of your life, your legacy will continue on this earth and will echo into eternity as you follow Jesus each and every day. So, how do we go about shifting the priorities in your life? How do we go about making sure that Jesus is first and foremost? I want to encourage you, uh, you can do it today. You can text I'm in to 474747. Our staff would love to meet with you. We would love to talk with you. We would love to walk through the process with you of, of realigning those things and making Jesus the first thing in your life. It's all one word. And if you are at our jail campus, I want you to go ahead and I want you to go to one of our leaders afterwards, one of our staff members. I want you to say, I want to make Jesus the main character of my life. How can I go about that? It's just as easy. It's almost as easy as opening a bag of chips. All you got to do is pull out your phone and text I'm in to 4747. Our staff would love to connect with you. We'd love to walk with you. We would love to show you and teach you how to make Jesus the main character of your life and how to teach other, how to point others to him as well. I love you guys. I'm so excited um, for all that Jesus is doing in, in and through this church. I'm so excited for all that he is accomplishing for his kingdom. And I'm just so glad to be on this journey, this story with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for today, for your life and for your love. We thank you that you, there is no one as worthy as you to be the main character of our life. And Jesus, we just pray that you would help us to realign our priorities. We ask you that you would give us the strength to follow after you each and every day and appoint others to your name, to your glory, to your kingdom, so that we can truly see generation after generation become fully devoted followers of Jesus, not in Wheatfield, in DeMott, in Rensselaer, in Roselawn, in Hebron, and all throughout Northwest Indiana. Jesus, we pledge our lives to you and we just ask you to move through us in a great and mighty way as we make you the main character. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we pray and everyone said, amen. Will you stand with us as our band leads us in one, song, one more song?